Good morning and welcome to Emanuel Lutheran Church of Prescott Valley, Arizona on this fifth Sunday in the season of Lent. We're delighted that you're here with us and I invite you to pause the video at this time if you haven't had an opportunity to go online and download our Order of Worship, which would be at our website at emmanuellutheranpv.org and that'll allow you to follow along with all the words uh, of the liturgies as well as the hymns and also uh, have an opportunity to see announcements and those sorts of things. And so let us begin for we gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We say our confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close to Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Beloved, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Please join me in our opening hymn, Now the Green Blade Rises. O God, with steadfast love, you draw us to yourself, and in mercy you receive our prayers. Strengthen us to bring forth the fruits of the Spirit, that through life and death we may live in your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. And now it's time for the children's message. So today I have with me a couple of things because I want to talk about the Old Testament lesson from Jeremiah where he talks about God bringing God's message to us and writing it on our hearts. That's kind of an amazing thought. Our hearts are inside us. How can something be written on our hearts? But today I brought with me a Sharpie and you see what it says right on it? It calls it a permanent marker. That means that you can't just use an eraser on it. It's really hard to make that marker go away. And I also have a very sweet little heart, just like maybe it's like my heart. And what Jeremiah was talking about, he was a prophet, and he said that God will write God's commandments on our hearts so we'll never forget them. And like in a permanent marker like this, so the one that we remember as being the most important rule of all is that Jesus told us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our mind, and all our soul, and our neighbor as ourselves. So we're supposed to love God. I'll write that down here. Love God. And then I'm going to write myself. And 
and neighbor. Right there, impermanent marker on my little heart so that I'll always remember. And that's what God said, is that he'll write this on our hearts. And so as we remember, because Jesus told us that, that we'll love God, love ourselves, and our neighbors. So let's pray. Dear Lord, help us to remember always your commandments that are written on our hearts to love you, love ourselves, and our neighbors. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's kids say, Amen. Our first reading comes from Jeremiah, the 31st chapter, beginning with the 31st verse. The Judeans in Babylon blamed their exile on their ancestors, who had broken the covenant established at Sinai. Here the prophet looks to a day when God will make a new covenant with the people. There will be no need to teach the law because God will write it on their hearts. So beginning with the 31st verse. The days are surely coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new commandment with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the commandment that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, a covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, says the Lord. But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No longer shall they teach one another or say to each other, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, says the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and remember their sins no more. Word of God, word of life, thanks be to God. Our gospel reading comes from the 12th chapter of John, beginning with the 20th verse. Now among those who went up to worship at the festival were some Greeks. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, and said to him, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. Philip went and told Andrew, and then Andrew and Philip went and told Jesus. Jesus answered them, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, very truly, I tell you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. 
Those who love their life lose it, and those who hate their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I go, there will my servant be also. Whoever serves me, the Father will honor. Now my soul is troubled, and what should I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it is for this reason that I have come to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd standing there heard it and said it was the thunder. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus answered, This voice has come for your sake, not for mine. Now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. And so let us pray. Dear Father, Mother, Creator of the universe, be present as we proclaim your word. Continue to walk with us on our Lenten journey toward the cross. And may your new commandment and covenant be written on our hearts that we might do your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The entire Old Testament is a story of rebellion. It begins with God's goodness and creation, followed by that very first disobedience of Adam and Eve, who could not resist that forbidden fruit. The story continues with the unconditional covenant made by God with Abraham, violated repeatedly by various forms of disobedience in the lives of Abraham's children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. God does not give up on them, but sends Moses to deliver the people of Israel from their bondage in Egypt. In the Sinai wilderness, God gives them yet another fresh start, declaring them to be God's people and giving them the Ten Commandments. But before the tablets are even cold, the rebellious people are already making a golden calf to worship behind Moses' back. Still, God does not give up. God brings them into the Promised Land in spite of their repeated betrayals and bad behavior. True to form, they have no longer settled, then they start looking longingly at those forbidden pagan gods of Canaan. God sends them prophet after prophet to warn them, but they continue to disobey the commandments, especially that first one, you shall have no other gods before me. Then two mighty pagan powers from Mesopotamia, first the Assyrians and then the Babylonians, they have swept over Israel destroyed the Temple of Solomon, ravaged the cities and towns, and carried off her people into exile. Today's lesson from Jeremiah is an important message that is crucial to our faith today. We need to understand the historical contents. Without the Hebrew prophets, you and I would not be here in church today, even online. Without the Hebrew prophets, the faith of Israel would have perished from the earth. Today's lesson is taken from a letter written by Jeremiah to comfort the Jews whose institutions and cultures had been destroyed by pagan invaders. Jeremiah was one of the two great prophets, the other one was Ezekiel, who lived through the Babylonian invasion and exile. What was it like to be exiled? Some of us feel like we know that a little bit now. Being driven away from home was bad enough, but even worse was this overwhelming sense that they had been abandoned by God. How were they to cope with this terrible, life-threatening feeling? They were faced with two unacceptable conclusions. Either God was too weak to defend them against the foreign powers and their gods, or God had cast them aside permanently because of their disobedience to God's commandments. In the middle of this terrible dilemma, here is what Jeremiah wrote. 
Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new commandment, a new covenant with the people of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke. This is the covenant which I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I'll put my law within them and I will write it upon their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. For I forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sins no more. This key passage gives us the term new covenant. At the last supper, Jesus tells his disciples this is the new covenant in my blood. Is he thinking about Jeremiah's words? Hmm. Why did there need to be a new covenant? What was wrong with the old one? Was it too harsh or maybe too difficult? Was it too unloving or was it too Old Testament-y? <laughs> there is only one thing wrong with that old one. It didn't have the power to create obedience. Human nature is just too weak. Paul said it well in Romans chapter 7. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. So the story of Israel, which is told uh, to us all, tells of a people who have come to God in God's commandments and have crashed and burned. In his confessions, Augustine wrote of his struggle to obey God's law. Oh God, he cried, make me chaste, but not yet. <laughs> no more eloquent account of the inability of the unaided human beings to obey God has ever been written. Augustine felt that he was helpless before the demands of the law. So what does God do in this new covenant? Does God soften the Old Covenant? Does God make it easier? Does God announce that God used to be that mean old God of the Old Testament, but now has decided to be the all-forgiving God of the New Testament? Does God tell Augustine, sorry, those were too hard. You don't have to follow any of those commandments. I was just kidding. None of the above. If anything, God ups the ante considerably. Remember, Jesus has been preaching a new idea, to love your neighbor and to pray for those who persecute you. Those who give up their lives will save them. No, God has not weakened that Old Testament covenant in the least when a new one is made. God has made it even stronger. Well, if the new covenant isn't less demanding than the old one, then what good is it? If we weren't able to the, obey the old one, how are we going to do any better with the new one? What's the difference between the old and the new covenant? Only this. The old one is written in stone, an external piece of rock. The new one is internal. It's written on our hearts. When God's law is written on our hearts by the Holy Spirit, we discover that God's will and our will can be one of the same. Not only will we want to perpetually not be angry with our brother, not only will we not want to commit adultery, we won't commit adultery. We won't nurse anger and we won't even notice that we're not doing it. That's freedom. Our wills, our wants and desires have blended with God's will. Seems impossible? In Mark 10, 27, Jesus says that with us it is impossible, but not with God. For all things are possible with God. Remember that terrible story of the killing of the Amish girls 14 years ago? A gunman broke into their one-room schoolhouse and ultimately shot and killed five of them and injured five others before killing himself. The Amish community believes in forgiveness and they showed the world what forgiveness looks like when they attended the funeral of the gunman and then embraced his family afterwards. The Amish community used this terrible, 
horrible experience to strengthen their faith in God. The community said that this was a chance for them to learn something about how to be better people to each other and to the world around them. This is what it means to have God's covenant written on our hearts. What's different in the new covenant is the way that we're allowed to know God. And that way is through Jesus. That's what is profoundly different between our relationship with God and that of our Old Testament ancestors. Next Sunday is Palm Sunday. We're going to get to meet outside, hopefully. I'm praying for warm weather and no winds. Jesus enters Jerusalem in triumph, but soon hears the jeers of the crowd and the ridicule of the soldiers. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he kneels on the ground in agony. He sweats drops of blood in his anguish, and he prays to his Father, not my will, but yours be done. In him, all the history of Israel is summed up. Our disobedience becomes his burden to carry. The Lord has laid on him the iniquity of, it, of us all, it says in Isaiah 53. In Jesus, the Son of God, the new covenant is fulfilled. We've been given this amazing gift in Jesus, the word, the way, the hope, and it's ours to accept. And if we do, we can come to know God in the most intimate ways possible, for God will have written it on our hearts. Amen. Please join us in singing the hymn of the day, My Song is Love Unknown. of intercession. Relying on the promises of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. You wash us through and through and remember our sin no more. Make your church a community of forgiveness throughout the world. Give your people courage to forgive. Through them, show the world new possibilities. Bless ministries of repentance and reconciliation. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. You fill the earth from tiny grains of wheat to the mighty thunder with your presence, and you call us to attend to your will for all creation. Grant weather that prepares the soil for seeds, protect all from violent storms, flooding and wildfires, especially the tornadoes that we're experiencing in the South. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. 
You promise to write your law on our hearts. Guide citizens throughout the world to shape communities that reflect your mercy, justice, and peace, and give them creativity to work for the welfare of all. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. You sustain us with your bountiful spirit. Restore the joy of all who need to know your presence, those who are lonely or feel unforgivable, those who need healing of mind or body, those who are dying, all who grieve and those affected by the global pandemic. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Jesus calls us to follow him in life and death. Empower this congregation in discipleship. Equip children and teachers in Sunday school, confirmation and learning ministries. Give us your truth and wisdom and teach us to follow Jesus. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Please take this time to offer any other prayers you may have, either silently or aloud. In the cross of Christ, your name is glorified. We praise you for those who have given us words to worship you. With all those who have died in Christ, bring us into life everlasting. We entrust ourselves and all of our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Gathered together as God's people, we share the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. At this time, we give thanks for the offerings that we have received in the mail, online, and in person this past week. These gifts make it possible for us to continue to be the church in the world, even when we can't meet face-to-face -face in our sanctuary. If you're worshiping with us online and would like to make a donation, please go to our website homepage and click on the online giving link. And so let us pray. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things. Through your goodness, you've blessed us with these gifts, ourselves, our time, and our possessions, and your Son, Jesus. Use us and what we have gathered to show the world your love through the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And so, friends, hear this benediction. You are what God made you to be created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you, that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Please join us in singing our closing hymn, The Lord Now Sends Us Forth. And so friends, go in peace, share the good news, 
Thanks be to God. And I hope to see many of you at our uh, Palm Sunday worship service next Sunday at 1 o'clock in the parking lot. Bring your chairs and your masks and we will celebrate Palm Sunday together. And then hopefully the following week on Easter, do the same.